Imagine that you're in the LAX with a colleague for six hours. Now you have to decide, is it worth your time to spend the time talking with him, having a conversation? Is he interesting enough to do that? Or is that time wasted and you might as well get your tablet out now because you want to avoid that conversation? This is actually one of the ways that Google determines whether or not they want to hire an individual. They look at Googliness. Their attribute that they use for people who are interesting, fascinating, well-rounded, likable people. Google no longer looks for just the brightest. They look for the best all around. Because of their success in hiring, they've led to acquisitions of hundreds of companies. As CNBC reported, 10 notable Google acquisitions since 1998, when the business began, they've made over 100 acquisitions, including Android, Applied Semantics, YouTube, Zagat, Picasa, Mebo, and Sparrow, all recently. These acquisitions have led to over 47 free products offered online, including your typical web search, Google Earth, Google Maps, Gmail, things that we use in everyday life. This doesn't even include, though, the products you can buy, like Google's Glasses, or Chrome TV, or Chromecast, all things that Google is now offering. As a matter of fact, Google has changed the world so much that you no longer search the internet, you Google. Because of their changes to the world, they've become an example for businesses. Google is a model business structure for other companies through its management style, decision-making processes, and culture. The first place where we can see this Googliness take effect is in the management team. At Google, they do things a little bit differently. According to A. Stiver and S. Alange in their article, Do TQM, Total Quality Management, Principles Need to Change, Learning from a Comparison to Google Incorporated, there are eight critical keys to Google's success that were found across interviews with multiple different employees. These interviews proved that Everything comes down to just a couple key factors, three of those directly tied to management. The first one, and I quote, is an innovation-oriented uh, innovation and change-prone top management and board. The second is leaders that empower, coach, and remove obstacles for innovation. And the third is a semi-structured and ambidextrous organization. They go further on to say that leaders were to act as facilitators in innovative processes and as cultural ambassadors and connectors. Leaders should empower their employees, trust and support them in new projects, and remove obstacles for innovation. Google does things a little bit differently. Their managers are facilitators. They're there to determine how to take care of things, but they're not there to micromanage. They're there to be ambassadors, as we can see here very clearly in their ambassador suite, taking care of facilitation. But how do they create this management system, a round table sort of effect? How do they keep the flat management as a possibility? Oxygen. They let their employees breathe. Well, literally, they let their employees breathe. But furthermore, there's actually a project oxygen that Google ran. In an article called How Google Sold Its Engineers on Management by David A. Garvin, it talks about Originally, when Google was created, the owners thought that management might not actually be needed if you had the right group of engineers together. They actually went for a period of a couple of months without any managers whatsoever. And then the owner, Larry Page, got really irritated at thousands of emails that he couldn't answer on time. So they finally went back to management. But they wanted to prove to engineers that managers were needed. Because engineers don't like managers. They like to be free to do their own work. Project Oxygen took care of this. 
And as we can see, the eight key principles of management were found, just like in the previous standard, eight key principles being critical to the success. These principles were found in those who show the highest satisfaction with their managers. There was anonymous feedback provided, and now it's provided every two, uh, two times a year by the employees for the managers. And those who don't do well in the category are allowed to do training with Google Human Resources and other managers that did well in it so that they can improve their management style and increase employee satisfaction. This program has had so much success that now all new managers go through a two-day program explaining the eight different management principles and how they affect their business life. These eight principles, it's important to keep in mind, are not enforced. As a matter of fact, they're completely optional, additional aspects of being a manager. But, as Google would say, a few things that will lead to be perceived as a better manager. They allow them to improve, to enhance themselves. And that's what takes us to our decision making. How do they make decision choices? Hopefully not many of you have had a boss that makes decisions this way. It would be a little bit bad. However, most of us instead are stuck struggling to think of what answers to choose. Which answer might be right? Which answer might be wrong for our company? And Google is just the same. Google takes a different look on this perspective though. They put an emphasis on data and hypothesizing on theories. They particularly use this in their hiring process because as you realize, there's no right and wrong decision necessarily for the hiring process. There's many different paths that you can take. With this hiring process, the reason that they're so important is because great companies are made up by great people. And Google has great people. When uh, Quartz Magazine wrote an article, Why Google Doesn't Care About Hiring Top College Graduate, it states that they're no longer looking at the GPA, schools that they attended, or even the brain teasers that they used to, as much as they look for what's called intellectual humility, the ability to admit you're wrong after fighting avidly just because someone brings up a piece of evidence that proves something has changed. This allows them to reach a consensus, which is how Google does their decision-making process. It's all about reaching a consensus together. According to How Google Works by Eric Schmidt and Jonathan Rosenberg, two previous CEOs, when they look for employees, they take advantage of the herd effect. The idea that good employees bring more good employees with them because all these great employees stick together and they follow each other around to companies as they try and find the best company for them. What Jonathan would do sometimes in his programs would be as he's interviewing a candidate, if he was having trouble selling it, he would pull out a stack of resumes from previously hired employees and put it in front of them, have them read through it. After reading through, typically it would close the deal. However, hiring isn't the only decision that has to be made. China is a large venue and has a great opportunity economically. Google went into China, according to Schmidt and Rosenberg, back in 2004. They had an opportunity to expand their borders. But as they went in, they struggled with issues such as censorship and ratting out people who were using their services. China is very strict about their policies. Finally, China actually accusedly hacked Google's network and tried to steal their coding. As they did this, they took away the opportunity for Google to really draw a clear line between don't be evil and make money, which is two very important factors of any business. Google ultimately decided to leave China in favor of following their philosophical and ethical values of business. Google's culture is part of what makes this decision-making and management possible. They have many different people, different aspects that all go around the center of shared values. VU is one company, like many other companies, that strives to follow Google's cultural example. Google's not like other companies in their aspirations. Instead, they find people with great values and they bring them together. They create what's called a good router, in their opinion. Somebody who's able to continue flowing that culture out to other people and spread it further and further with them. Deborah Shipman wrote an article called Can We Learn a Few Things from Google? Discussing how Google focuses on job satisfaction. 
She quotes that employees can work on projects on company time, whether or not it benefits the corporation. This allows for proper team building opportunities for expansion and innovation that most companies don't provide. It also provides fun things like on-site masseuse, which makes it a fun but a hard environment to work. You can see here hammocks in the main office. The environment, the culture that they create is one of relaxation, trying to create and promote innovation as he works on most likely a new product or fixing an old product. This environment has fostered learning, the ability for them to adapt and change. Schmidt and Rosenberg give a great example of this from a day when Larry Page, one of the owners, was sitting in his office on a Friday afternoon and was searching on Google, found out that some of the ads that were popping up made no sense for what he was searching. He printed off the pages, wrote, these ads suck, snapped it in the uh, kitchen, and left for the day. Monday morning, 5.05 a.m., a search engineer, Jeff, sent out a mass email explaining how he had agreed with the picture, found the problem in the software, found a solution to it, created a prototype and tested it over the weekend, and provided the results that he had found. This is the atmosphere that Google creates. This is the culture, innovation, improvement, constantly looking for where they can find solutions, how they can fill needs that are around them. The About section for culture of Google really explains it. It's really the people that make Google the kind of company it is. We strive to maintain the open culture, often associated with startups, in which everyone is a hands-on contributor and feels comfortable sharing ideas and opinions. True culture is everyone's culture. So the next time that you have a question, you have a concern, you aren't sure what to do, let me give you a pretty simple answer. You can look through the decision-making processes that Google does. You can look at their management revenues, how they, how they work everything together in their culture. And finally, if you still don't find the answer, you can Google it. 